Good morning, church. Good to have you here today. Would you uh, stand with me for the call to worship and a time of prayer together? Our call to worship comes from Psalm 103, the first five verses, and it goes like this. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Lord God, thank you so much that that's the kind of love and mercy and grace that you show us, your people. We're grateful to be in your house on this first day of the week as we uh, uh, have gathered in and walked into the sanctuary and saw all the decorations. And for those out on Facebook who are watching and uh, wondering what's behind us, uh, all the things prepared for VBS tomorrow and just an exciting day to be in the house of the Lord and see ministry that's going to be happening this week with our children and uh, just a great opportunity to uh, share the gospel uh, with kids from our community. But right now, here we are, your people in this house or watching on Facebook Live, having the opportunity to enter into a time to worship you. And so, Father, would you help us to set aside each and everything that may hinder us from being able to focus in on you this morning and allow your spirit to wash over us and us to enter into a worship experience. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Grab your hymnals. Let's sing together. Hymn number seven, love divine, all love excelling. Number seven. <clears throat> Nice. 
as far as a, uh, a, 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 a communal reading, we've been trying to introduce this. I know we share the scripture lesson with you. Someone comes up and reads that portion of scripture from which I'm going to be preaching from later on in the service. But one of the new things that we've added to our service is an opportunity for you to speak scripture as well, for you to articulate the word of God in the service. And so we've been using responsive readings. We've been use, using unison readings. This one in your bulletin is called an antiphonal reading. And the reason for that, if you are aware of Psalm 136, there's 26 verses to it. And each time the psalmist makes a statement and then the people respond, his love endures forever. And so 26 times the people would respond back to the leader as they were sharing, as he was sharing these portions of Scripture out of Psalm 136. Now, it, I would love for you to take an opportunity to read all of Psalm 136. We're not going to do the antiphonal reading this morning of all of it because it's a history of the children of Israel post-Exodus and leading up to the promised land. You'll catch that as, you, as you're reading down through it if you take an opportunity to do that this afternoon. But I pulled out several verses, 1, 3, 23, and 24, and 26. These ones would reflect kind of a, an overall view of Psalm 136. And for each time that I, as the leader, share a phrase, I would love for you to respond, His love endures forever. However, if you look at your bulletin, you will see that one word in each phrase is capitalized and it is emboldened. And so what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to lean into that word. And so if it's the word his, I'd like his love endures forever. His love endures. I'd like you to focus in on those words when we hit it. And then you can see that the last time we come together, we'll lean on every single one of those words. And so let's read this antiphonally together. You only get that one phrase but I'd like you to see how that phrase changes each and every time that you emphasize a different word. So let me share Psalm 136, a few of the verses that are relevant for us here today. Here's the reading. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords. To the one who remembered us in our low estate and freed us from our enemies. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. Leland, would you come and let's sing some more about this God of ours and his great love. Hymn number 222, Speak, Lord, in the Stillness. Would you stand with me as we sing?
Today's scripture reading is taken from 2 Acts 2, 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as they had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Would you take your hymnals and join me once again in hymn number 328, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, 328. Would you stand with me as we sing? As we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, let's remember those that are still uh, uh, not being able to be with us yet for one reason or another. Some are uh, uh, recuperating from various illnesses and injuries as well as uh, there's just that overall uh, uh, anxiousness of coming back after uh, such a long absence away and uh, all the things that uh, our country has been talking about and dealing with. And so uh, we want to be remembering those and lifting them up before the Lord today. I love the fact, blessed be the tie that binds in those last couple of verses. We share our mutual woes, which we do. We come together and share different prayer requests and such with each other. Our mutual burdens we bear, and often for each other flows a sympathizing tear. And how many times have we been together and we've heard about something that's happening in our loved one's lives here at church or with family or such, and we, we find ourselves heartsick over it, hurt over it, and... Uh, uh, spend some time in prayer with a, a bit of a tear in our eyes that, oh God, help them, uh, be with them and show your grace and mercy. And this is uh, quite relevant for us as we have come back to the, uh, to the sanctuary together. When we asunder part, it gives us inward pain, but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. And that is true, whether or not we meet on this side of eternity or, or the other, we have this opportunity and I'm grateful. Uh, to see you here today and have opportunity to, to worship with you. So would you bow your heads and hearts and uh, let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much uh, for the, your watch care over us over these uh, past several months as uh, our nation and the world has been reeling uh, with uh, uh, 
both things that uh, are, are, have been exaggerated and things that have not. Uh, things that have been scary and things that have been ridiculous. Things that have been, uh, uh, Father, challenging for us and things that we've kind of shaken our head at. There's been so many different thing, thoughts and emotions. But one thing is for certain, uh, Father, we're grateful that your watch care has been over us through the whole thing. Uh, regardless of our opinion of what this has been all about or the plan of how to come back together as a nation or a world, we're so grateful you never left us. You never forsook, forsook us. And so, Father, we gather once again in your house, those that are, are here this morning, and we're here with grateful hearts. Uh, it's good to be back together again and worshiping uh, together. And our hearts and our prayers go out to those for one reason or another can't be with us quite yet. And Father, we just pray that, uh, uh, Father, your grace and your mercy would be upon them, that you would hold them tightly in the palm of your hand. You would gather them underneath your wings, as the Bible says, a hen gathers her chicks. And may they sense not only your love and your presence, but they would, uh, uh, Father, through your grace and mercy, sense that their church family loves them as well and is lifting them up before the throne of grace, even now. Uh, and that we miss them, and that, uh, Father, we would uh, uh, wish them uh, nothing but the best here today, nothing but God's grace and mercy to flow over them today. Father, would you be with all the various requests and things that uh, have come across uh, 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 the airways here and have been out on the prayer chain, and uh, we've emailed back and forth and uh, kept people updated about. And, uh, Father, we just pray that you, you would be all things to all situations there. Would you bring financial relief and uh, emotional release? Uh, would you bring a strength to our families? Uh, Father, there are folks that, uh, uh, that are struggling in their marriages and struggling in their, uh, uh, in their uh, spiritual lives. And uh, uh, Father, we just pray that you would just be near them and may they sense that you love them and want to draw them to yourself. And uh, Father, that you want to redeem any situation they may find themselves in. God, we're just so grateful you are a God that gives us chance after chance after chance to make connections with you and to grow in the grace and knowledge of who you are. And so, Father, thank you for what you're doing in and around and through us, and we pray that you would continue to do so, uh, not only as we walk our way through this service, this worship time with you, but, Father, as we leave this place and we... Uh, uh, celebrate Father's Day uh, over the course of today as we go through uh, this next week. And Father, give us opportunity to be salt and light in the world around us, we pray. All this we ask through the one who made it all possible, Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated for just a moment. I would like to just honor our dads here for just a moment, if I may. Uh, I won't ask any dads to stand up or to re reveal themselves or come forward or anything like that, but uh, we, are, uh, we are celebrating our dads this morning and uh, welcoming them here to the service as well as wishing them a happy Father's Day today. And uh, uh, I would like to offer a word of prayer over you, dads specifically, if I may. Uh, we do have a flashlight. And in the, I don't know how in the world, I kept trying to find something that what we could give out as a small gift uh, to the dads to just let them know that we care about them, love them, just wanted to give them a little gift. And I couldn't find anything that was either really, really dirt cheap that just didn't say uh, we really love you or was way more than we had put into the ladies. Okay, so you're all giggling and laughing, but not one guy laughed at that. Like, yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. No, I found something you're like, this would, the guys would love this, eight bucks a piece. Oh. <laughs> we break the bank doing it to the guys. So I, I finally found these flashlights. I thought, oh, great, a flashlight. What guy wouldn't have one of those and throw it into, his, in, into the glove compartment or stick it in his toolbox or whatnot? And then when I was bringing them out this morning, I remembered that they decorated for uh, camp, and I thought, ah, it's amazing how the Lord works. And so you got, you, guys, you got a whole camping theme we put together here for you. This has nothing to do with Vacation Bible School. It has everything to do with we just decorated for you. It's Father's Day, and we made it look very woodsy up here. In fact, somebody had made a comment that they wanted to put a, a diffuser up here and uh, uh, to let a pine scent go out. And I said, why don't you just wipe down the pews with pine saw? That'd be awesome, too, you know, if you wanted to do that. Do a little cleaning while you're at it. But, guys, we're just very grateful to our dads and for the part that you play in our lives. And so uh, if you'd bow your heads and hearts with me, I'd like to just offer a prayer uh, for our dads this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, you are our uh, our Heavenly Father, and so it's great on a Father's Day that we can come before you. You entrusted your Son, Jesus, 
uh, as, uh, as a little baby to the child Mary, to the care of Joseph, and an earthly father. And so today we ask you to bless our earthly fathers and give them the strength, the wisdom, the, the patience, the, the generosity, and the grace needed to fulfill their responsibilities as dads. It's a tall task. It's a tall order. And we're grateful that we can, in all things, find sufficiency in you. We understand that our earthly fathers are fallible, and it's not no easy task to be a dad, especially in today's culture. Therefore, we ask that you show them as they acknowledge and learn from their mistakes and give us the grace to extend to them the same forgiveness that you, our Heavenly Father, extended to us. Provide for their needs today and all days, we pray, as they selfishly provide for ours. We ask all this of you, our Heavenly Father, our solid rock, our shield, and our defender. Amen and amen. It's my opportunity to... Uh, preach at this time. Look at that. Holy cow. I'm going to put this down over here someplace. <clears throat> I, uh, I said to keep the pulpit, uh, and then uh, I got severe pushback yesterday as they were decorating. You have to keep the pulpit. I said it was made out of wood. This shouldn't be a problem here. And they're like, we could light it on fire like a campfire. Oh, whoa. So the pulpit is fine, and it's, uh, it's just tucked away for a little bit, but uh, uh, Yes, uh, I know that the video doesn't show exactly what's happening up here on the platform, but we are prepared for uh, a vacation Bible school tomorrow, and we're excited about having the kids in and, uh, and doing some things with them and enjoying about a three-day vacation Bible school. So, we, uh, let, me, let me get into this. We are in this, this series called Essential, and today I'd like to talk about essential ministry, if I may, for just a little while. We have four paintings displayed along the back wall of our sanctuary. Let me, let me tell the story behind those pieces. And uh, uh, for those of you in Facebook, if you've never seen those paintings, maybe I'll do a devotional this week and kind of show those pictures so you know what I'm talking about. But 24 years ago, 24 years ago, uh, back in 1996, our own artist in residence, the late Mary May, painted a beautiful mural of Jesus with his arms outstretched, which was displayed on the back wall of our sanctuary, right where the media crew is uh, and where they sit. However, about 16 years ago, we built a media booth, which caused the picture to be somewhat hidden back in that area. And in actuality, it kind of looked like Jesus was sitting in the media booth going, hey, your mic's off. Hey, turn your mic on. It did. It looked like he was actually sitting in the booth. And we thought, that's just not... That's not really what Mary wanted for this picture of Jesus, this mural of Jesus, to be kind of lost back there. But there was no other place in the sanctuary really to place it. And so uh, when I spoke to Mary in the spring of 2009 in regards to uh, commissioning her to create four new paintings to go above that area along that wall section there, which um, if you're familiar, uh, many of you in the 8 o'clock service here are, that in between those two wall sections is an uh, uh, altar rail against the back wall that's from the original building and so there's some historical value that's up there that uh, a lot of people who are new to our church don't realize that that's old altar rail from the original building and then she she com and we commissioned her to make those paintings for us uh, now we didn't get rid of the mural of jesus by any stretch we took it down we put it in the boardroom just off to the right there and uh, it hangs there as a reminder to our board members that Jesus is to be our ultimate example as we endeavor to lead and to serve this congregation. In fact, one of the sub-pictures on that mural is Jesus washing the disciples' feet, serving uh, the Lord. However, these four paintings that here are currently uh, hanging here in the sanctuary serve as a visual representation of the church as recorded in Acts 2.42, the very first verse that, that uh, Justin read for you today. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. These four concepts that the early church devoted themselves to are truly the essence of essential ministry. We've been looking at this idea of what is essential. What is essential worship a couple weeks ago? What is essential discipleship last week? There are five basic purposes for the church which we outline in our vision statement here at Bentley Creek Wesleyan, and that is to honor the Lord through worship, to equip the saints through discipleship, to answer the call through ministry, reach the lost through evangelism, and tend the flock through fellowship. 
honor, equip, answer, reach, and tend. H-E-A-R-T. We're the stone church with the warm heart, of course. All of these interconnect with one another, creating the, the spiritually healthy environment known as the church of Jesus Christ. Well, with all that in mind, consider this question. What ministries of this church should be considered essential? And therefore, though they may have had to have taken a hiatus over, uh, you know, during the whole quarantine, should be restarted. And possibly, which ministries or portions thereof would we be better off not restarting? That's kind of a scary one. What? What? Not starting something we used to do? Acts 2.42 defines essential areas or focuses in ministry that the early church had. We would do well to consider each of them as we look to reassess, revamp, and restart the various ministries of our church. Or not. Maybe maybe we don't need to start certain things. So let's take a look. Here's the first one. Four different things to share with you today. The first one is this. An essential ministry is that which focuses on the great commandment and the great commission. The first thing we see the early church focusing on was, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And what exactly did the apostles teach? Well, they taught the exclusivity and sufficiency of Jesus Christ for salvation. You know, one of the first things that the apostle Peter uh, taught about Jesus was this in Acts 4.12. He said, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. The apostles were the eyewitnesses of the Messiah, and so they shared his life, his teachings, as well as his heart with the world. The focus of their teaching was the same as that of Jesus. And Jesus' focus was on the great commandment and the great commission. Jesus told a group of Pharisees that the great commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. You've heard that before. And it was also Jesus who gave us the great commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Just as essential discipleship, which we talked about last week, is the acquiring and applying of the Word of God, essential ministry is that which we engage in that accomplishes that very task. Dare I ask, if a disciple ministry in our church does not accomplish this, is it truly essential? I mean, that's a hard question to ask sometimes when we we like certain ministries. We've been doing them forever. Uh, We enjoy them. But is it essential if it doesn't do that? If a teaching ministry here at Bentley Creek uh, is not practically calling for us to love God with everything we got and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the world, then is it really essential that we should be doing it? Here's the second concept that the early church focused on. The apostles' teaching was one. Here's uh, another one. Number two, an essential ministry is that which focuses on coming together and caring for each other. When Jesus was teaching the great commandment to the Pharisees, he didn't stop with the first and the greatest commandment. You remember, he kept going. He continued by saying, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, he concluded with this statement, all the law and the prophets, everything you've been reading in the Bible hangs on these two commandments. And sure enough, here's the next thing mentioned in Acts 2.42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship. Now, when we hear the word fellowship, (laughs) we Wesleyans, probably Baptists, Methodists, and Episcopalians as well, you know, we always say it's just a Wesleyan thing, but I've been to a lot of different kinds of churches, and pretty much any time you mention fellowship, there's another F word that goes with it, and it's the word food. Oh, we like that one, don't we? Fellowship time over coffee, which, by the way, is coming back in July. We will have coffee. There'll be some mitigation involved in it and everything to keep everybody safe, but we, we gonna make, coffee will be made available. Can I get an amen? Okay, sure, we've got that going. Church dinners, not quite ready for that yet. We're going to get there. Visiting a friend at their home and sitting around the table, snacking and yakking. We like fellowship. We enjoy it. We've always associated fellowship with food, and yet the Greek word for fellowship, it's the word koinonia, It means so much more than just food. The concepts of koinonia can be seen in many passages that talk about coming together and caring for each other. Again, Jesus was our uh, example in how he treated others and how he reached out and put the needs of others above his own. 
He was constantly coming together with others and and caring for their needs. From the feeding of the 5,000 to his healings to his willingness to associate with those who the world had written off like Zacchaeus or the woman at the well. And Jesus taught us that the greatest among you will be your servant. And sure enough, we see that echoed in the apostles' teachings. Remember, the apostles' teachings was taking what Jesus modeled, what Jesus taught, and giving it to us again. And so Paul told the Galatians in Galatians 5.13, serve one another in love. Peter wrote, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. That's 1 Peter 4.10. And Paul told the Philippians, in humility, Consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. It's throughout the New Testament where there's this idea of koinonia, this idea of fellowship, coming together and caring for one another. A few years back, Karen Robinson started a ministry entitled In His Service, which technically when Karen did it, it should have been in her service. But uh, I guess the his is Jesus, so it should stay in his service, right? Its purpose, to assist those in our midst that could benefit from the able hands of willing volunteers. Its mission, to share the love of Christ in tangible ways as we meet the needs of those in our church and community. That's that's right from their brochure. How exactly do they accomplish this? Well, they have a long list of things that they do. But the majority of the time, it's yard work and basic home maintenance tasks, for the most part. Yeah, there's other things they do too, but... For the most part, that's really what's happening with them. This is an essential ministry that focuses in on koinonia, on fellowship, on the coming together and the caring for one another. Which, by the way, there is an opportunity coming up on Monday, June 29th, not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow, to participate in this ministry. You can check your bulletin for information. And if you're out there and you don't have a bulletin, you can certainly uh, call the church office. be happy to give you details on that. But next, uh, a week from Monday is a, yet another opportunity to go and help a widow out uh, with some yard work and some things around the house there. So uh, a wonderful opportunity to engage in essential ministry. Here's the third concept that the early church focused in on. Number three, an essential ministry is that which focuses on commemorating Christ. Acts 2.42 states, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread. The breaking of bread obviously is a direct result of, uh, to communion. And it was the Apostle Paul who told us that whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Communion is one of the most sacred acts that we do as a church body. Through it, we commemorate Christ. We honor our Lord and Savior for who he is and, and what he's done for us. And the fact is our worship services are all about the same thing. See how these things, uh, essential worship and essential ministry, all come together. They dovetail in and out of one another. From the call to worship to the benediction, our worship services should be all about the breaking of bread, whether we have communion or not. It should all be about commemorating Christ. When one thinks of church, typically the first thing that passes through your mind is the Sunday morning worship service. If anybody says anything about church, that's typically the first, oh yeah, uh, we come together on Sundays. Yeah, it's a, you know, they, they've got a building, a big building, usually an organ or a piano and, and pews. Everybody thinks pews and then they get in, they're pleasantly surprised at their chairs or not pleasantly surprised. I kind of like the pews and so I'm an old soul, I guess. I, I've always liked the pews. They remind me of home. But this is what they think of. They, they, they typically think of that. And yet churches come in many shapes and sizes. Their buildings are different. Their music is different. Their pastors are different. Oh, amen for that, right? Could you imagine? We don't need two robs around here, not by any stretch. When it comes to the actual celebration of communion, some serve it once a quarter, some once a week. We typically serve communion once a month, which, by the way, we're serving communion next week. Just to put that on your radar, Matt. And yet one of the things that all Christian churches seem to have in common is the fact that we meet regularly in worship. We take the time to regularly break bread or commemorate Christ together. The writer of Hebrews exhorts, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Churches lose their essential status when they meet together more out of obligation or habit than for the express purpose of commemorating Christ. When it turns into a a social occasion, 
And yet it's so much more than that. Not that we don't come together in fellowship with one another, but when that's all it is, it ceases to be essential to come together. Here's the final concept that the early church focused on, and it's based on Acts 2, 42. Number four, an essential ministry is that which focuses on communicating with Christ. Here it is. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and here's this final one, and to prayer. Isn't that interesting that prayer is this final one, and yet, church, we don't do this one enough. Am I allowed to be honest with you on that? We, we tend to, this is the one that just kind of gets set on the back burner an awful lot. Sure, we, we have times of prayer, don't get me wrong, but they largely focus around our needs and not necessarily communicating with Christ. We pray for health concerns, traveling mercies, and decent weather for events that we've planned. It ain't like we haven't prayed for VBS and that we would have good weather for it, and yet we would like it to rain some point in time here. The gardens need it and such. But we tend to pray for those things. And not that we shouldn't. Not that those aren't things that we should be praying about. But we should also pray for those who persecute us. Matthew 5, 44. We talked about this at Immersed uh, last, uh, uh, last Thursday night. We talked about this idea of praying for those that uh, upset us, those that uh, are, are against us, our, our enemies. And yet... Uh, so many times in our heart of hearts when we're praying for our enemies, what kind of prayer does that really come out to be? Oh, Lord, strike them down. You know, and you, that's not the kind of prayer we're supposed to pray. We're supposed to lift them up and ask that God's grace would be upon them, that he would speak to their hearts. Give me an opportunity to show your love to my enemies, thus making them my friends and making them a child of God as well. Pray so that we will not fall into temptation. Matthew 26, 41 that we would pray against these things that would draw us away from the Lord, that would keep us from having a dynamic relationship with our Savior and Lord. We should, as Paul uh, wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray continually. Well, I've heard a lot of messages about what, what it means to pray continually, you know, and uh, how we might pray. Uh, we were just going down in the, uh, uh, we were driving home from someplace, and Amy we wanted to pray for something. I, don't, I remember exactly what we were praying about, but Amy said we really ought to, uh, ought to pray about this. And I said, okay, and then I, I, I'm driving. So I, I, I close my eyes and bow my head because that always makes her nervous when you do things like that. And she goes, nah, you can keep your eyes open while we pray. I said, technically, with this new car, I don't have to. Beep, 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 I, I can pretty much get a whole prayer in, and the dumb car will just kind of stay where it's supposed to stay. And if I put crews on, it'll slow me down and keep me with the traffic and everything. And she says, I still don't want you to close your eyes while you're praying. You leave your at 10 and 2 and keep your eyes open. And so I did, but we, uh, I, I forget what we were praying about. We thought we, we really need to lift that up in prayer. And so as we're driving down the highway, you know, we're praying. Pray continually. When it's time to pray, you should pray. Uh, we should uh, lift up things along the way. When people say, would you pray for me? We ought to take the opportunity to pray right then and there. Take them off to the side. It doesn't have to be a spectacle in the middle of Walmart. You can go down an aisle that no one's in and take an opportunity to pray with them. Our prayers should look more like communication with Christ than a list of wants and wishes. I know many times when we get to talking about prayer, that's one of the first things that happens. It turns into a wants and wishes list. You know, And we have any prayer requests? Boom, 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 boom. We start hearing about the you know, the financial situations or the marital situations, social situations or health concerns. And, stuff. and we start making ourselves a list. And there's nothing wrong with that, church. Nothing wrong with that at all. And yet prayer is an opportunity for us to talk to Christ and for Christ to talk to us. The Spirit of God to speak into our lives. Many are uncomfortable with prayer. They're uncomfortable with the silence of listening for the Lord to speak in their lives. I know that at times when I have a, a prayer time uh, with, with our Thursday night group, everybody's good at giving prayer requests. But then when we say, why don't a few of you pray out? And then I'll close. And you can hear crickets. <laughs> because everybody, ooh, you want me to pray out loud? You're like, well, yeah, talk to your Savior. And ooh, okay. And so it gets awful quiet, and that's kind of unsettling for some. And yet we're called to this. Prayer is essential to the Christian faith. And yet so few engage in it seriously. They're uncomfortable with the silence of listening for the Lord to speak in their lives and quite possibly nervous about what he might say if we allow him to, you know, Lord, speak to me. 
Now I want to get on with my life because I'm afraid that you might. And if you did, what you might say, what you might call me to. I know there have been several times when uh, I've been dealing with interpersonal relationships as a husband or as a, as a father or as a, as a pastor here, and you're walking around the sanctuary, and you're, I, I just want to vent to the Lord. Have you ever noticed that? I don't want any advice, God. I just want to vent. And so I'm, and then you get a little quiet because you kind of ran out of things to say, and then God starts speaking to your heart, and you're like, you know what, I need to get back to work. I need to get back into my office. i got plenty to do today. Why? Because you can already hear the, the Spirit of the Lord going, okay, you've had your opportunity. Now let me speak words of truth into your life. Well, I, I don't know if I want those. I wasn't really interested in hearing your opinion, Lord. I was more interested in giving you mine. Amen or ouch. Been there? Done. Hi, my name is Rob Woodridge. I'm a real person. This happens to me at times. Uh, your pastor walks around here and yells at God every once in a while. And uh, then God whispers back, I love you. That was uncalled for. Let me share some things with you. Ooh. Okay. Prayer is essential. Therefore, any ministry that the church provides that focuses on prayer and does so in a proper way, a biblical way, is essential as well. I find it interesting that prayer is one of those four things that are mentioned in Acts 2.42. The apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread. And don't forget talking to me and allowing me to talk to you. Wow. Wow. We need to do that one more. We need to have more opportunities where we spend time seriously in prayer. Not praying about things, but communicating with Christ. That's really what prayer is all about. Ministry in all its facets uh, are opportunities for you and I to grow closer to the Lord as well as to others. It's all about loving God with everything you got and sharing that love with other people. Great commission, great commandment. There are all kinds of things that a church can find themselves involved in, and what is truly essential for the church of Jesus Christ to be doing is the question that we ask. I mean, what, what do we really need to be about the business of doing? Well, essential ministry is that which focuses on those four things that we've got our pictures on the wall. The great commandment, as well as the great commission, coming together and caring for each other, commemorating Christ, and communicating with him. That's what the early church considered essential. And I love this. It starts with that. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Then it shares a little bit. You heard Justin read that. And then it ends with, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. When we do essential ministry, people turn their hearts to the Lord. We get opportunities to share our faith, and people respond because the Spirit of God is in. As we return from exile, and I know, after about a month, we're like, well, we're back, aren't we? Well, we're still bringing stuff online. Praise the Lord, next week will be the first week that we have children's church after vacation Bible school. The week after that will be our first Sunday school where we're bringing that back online. I talked with our hospitality coordinators. We're going to bring coffee back at Sunday school. We're not going to do any church dinners for a little while. So we're, we're, we're coming back in stages back to our time together as a church. But as we return from exile, let's pattern our ministries in like manner. We put those, those, those paintings up there. We commissioned Mary to make them because it's the essence of what essential ministry is. The apostles' teaching, the Word of God, the fellowship coming together and caring with each other, uh, the, uh, uh, the breaking of bread, worship together and communion, which we'll do next week, and this idea of prayer that I think as a church we need to get an even greater grip on, if I may say so. As we turn from exile, I say we pattern our ministries in like manner so that we too might see our community come to Christ, that God would add daily those who are being saved to hear at Bend the Creek. Let me pray for you. Lord God, I thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to look into your word here today. And Father, I know I leaned heavy on this prayer one. And maybe that's because I know that I struggle with it. And so I kind of think that if I'm struggling with it, there's a good chance that others struggle with it as well. That, uh, Father, I, I'm quick to share my requests. I'm quick to say, Lord, touch this and touch that, bless this and bless that, but not willing to be silent 
and to allow you to speak to my heart. Allow you to touch me, transform me in prayer. Awkward science, silences in prayer time sometimes are they're tough for us. And yet you want so much to speak to our hearts. And as the, uh, the prophet Jeremiah said, uh, well, God said through the prophet Jeremiah, to show us great and mighty things which we don't already know. And so, Father, uh, all four of these are essential ministry. I pray that as we continue to open up, as we continue to bring ministries back online, offline, however we want to say it, that, Father, we would ask ourselves that question, what do we truly need to be about as a church? And help us to focus in on those things for your honor, for your glory, that we might be the church you've called us to and that folks uh, in our area and around the world would come to know you because of the essential ministries that uh, you have given us the privilege to partake of, to have opportunity to do here at Bentley Creek and beyond. I thank you and I praise you for what you're doing in and around and through us today, tomorrow, and until such a day as you split the eastern sky, come and take us home. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you come? Would you take your hymnals once again and turn to hymn number 666-63, Make Me a Blessing. Would you stand with me as we sing? As we conclude our service, I, I just want to, uh, I want to give you some instruction on what this last 
few moments of your service is all about. I know we call it the fellowship time. I've talked to the, our, uh, our vice chairman who normally does the announcements and such. And let's be honest, I gave you a bunch of announcements in the middle of the message. I uh, shared them along the way. And, and you all know how to read, at least I think you do. And uh, uh, you've got those announcements. So we really don't need to share those announcements unless we had something special that we needed to give. Currently, we're not taking up an offering. It's in the back in the green, uh, green treasure chest. So if you'd like to give, you certainly can do that uh, through that. But many of you mail it in and uh, things have changed over time. This fellowship time at the conclusion of the benediction is your opportunity, yeah, to say hi and hello. But remember what fellowship is. It's coming together and caring for one another, which means when you say, hey, how are you today? They're allowed to be honest with you and to say, well, this is what I've been going with. Let me take a moment to pray with you. See how they all interconnect? So this time that we give you at the end of the service is essential ministry. Yeah, you can chit-chat with each other, and that's good too. But don't let it always be about chit-chat. As much as if you know somebody that really needs to be prayed for, take the opportunity. You're here. And so fellowship, koinonia, is so much more. And we want to give you more than 30 seconds to do it in a service. We want to give you time to connect with people, to come together and to care for one another, set plans to take good care of each other this week. I didn't realize you were going through that. Not only will I pray for you, but what are you doing on Tuesday? I'd like to come up and help you with that. That's what fellowship is. Just preached about it. So take the opportunity once we uh, come to a conclusion here after the benediction to koinonia with each other, to chit-chat, to yak a bit, but to pray for one another, to find out how you're really doing, and to see where you can connect with your fellow body of Christ to do some serious fellowship with one another, because that's what the body of Christ is about. Our benediction today is out of 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and it goes like this. Our God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things and at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God bless you and yours. Happy Father's Day to you, dads. You're dismissed to go coin India.